Section 15 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3 by Henry Grey. The Internal Carotid Artery, Arteria Carotis Interna. The Internal Carotid Artery supplies the anterior part of the brain, the eye and its appendages, and sends branches to the forehead and nose. Its size in the adult is equal to that of the external carotid, though in the child it is larger than that vessel. It is remarkable for the number of curvatures that it presents in different parts of its course. It occasionally has one or two flexures near the base of the skull, while in its passage through the carotid canal and along the side of the body of the sphenoid bone it describes a double curvature and resembles the italic letter S. Cause and Relations In considering the cause and relations of this vessel, it may be divided into four portions, cervical, petrose, cavernose, and cerebral. Cervical portion This portion of the internal carotid begins at the bifurcation of the coming carotid, opposite the upper border of the thyroid cartilage and runs perpendicularly upward, in front of the transverse processes of the upper three vertebrae, to the carotid canal in the petrose portion of the temporal bone. It is comparatively superficial at its commencement, where it is contained in the carotid triangle, and lies behind and lateral to the external carotid, overlapped by the sternocleidomastoideus and covered by the deep fascia, platysma, and integument. It then passes beneath the parotid gland, being crossed by the hypoglossal nerve and the digastricus and stilo hiatus, and the occipital and posterior auricular arteries. Higher up, it is separated from the external carotid by the styloclossus and stylopharyngeus. The tip of the styloid process and the stylohyoid ligament, the glossopharyngeal nerve, the pharyngeal branch of the vagus. It is in relation, behind, with the longus capitis, the superior cervical ganglion of the sympathetic trunk, and the superior laryngeal nerve, laterally, with the internal jugular vein and vagus nerve, the nerve lying on a plane posterior to the artery, medially, with the pharynx, superior laryngeal nerve, and ascending pharyngeal artery, at the base of the skull, the glossopharyngeal vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal nerves lie between the artery and the internal jugular vein. Petrose portion. When the internal carotid artery enters the canal in the petrose portion of the temporal bone, it first ascends a short distance, then curves forward and medialward, and again ascends as it leaves the canal to enter the cavity of the skull between the lingula and the petrosal process of the sphenoid. The artery lies at first in front of the cochlear and tympanic cavity. From the latter cavity it is separated by a thin bony lamella, which is cribriform in the young subject, and often partially absorbed in old age. Further forward it is separated from the semilunar ganglion by a thin plate of bone, which forms the floor of the fossa for the ganglion and the roof of the horizontal portion of the canal. Frequently this bony plate is more or less deficient, and then the ganglion is separated from the artery by fibrous membrane. The artery is separated from the bony wall of the carotid canal by a prolongation of dura mater, and is surrounded by a number of small veins and by filaments of the carotid plexus, derived from the ascending branch of the superior cervical ganglion of the sympathetic trunk. Cavernous portion. In this part of its course, the artery is situated between the layers of the dura mater forming the cavernous sinus but covered by the lining membrane of the sinus. It at first ascends toward the posterior clinoid process, then passes forward by the side of the body of the sphenoid bone, and again curves upward on the medial side to the anterior clinoid process, and perforates the dura mater forming the roof of the sinus. This portion of the artery is surrounded by filaments of the sympathetic nerve, and on its lateral side is the abducent nerve. Cerebral portion Having perforated the dura mater on the medial side of the anterior clinoid process, the internal carotid passes between the optic and oculomotor nerves to the anterior perforated substance at the medial extremity of the lateral cerebral fissure, where it gives off its terminal or cerebral branches. Peculiarities The length of the internal carotid varies according to the length of the neck, and also according to the point of bifurcation from the common carotid. 
it arises sometimes from the arch of the aorta in such rare instances this vessel has been found to be placed nearer the middle line of the neck than the external carotid as far upward as the larynx when the latter vessel crossed the internal carotid the course of the artery instead of being straight may be very tortuous a few instances are recorded in which this vessel was altogether absent in one of these the common carotid passed up the neck and gave off the usual branches of the external carotid the cranial portion of the internal carotid was replaced by two branches of the internal maxillary which entered the skull through the foramen rotundum and foramen ovale and joined to form a single vessel branches the cervical portion of the internal carotid gives off no branches those from the other portions are from the petrose portion keratico-tympanic artery of the pterygoid canal from the cavernous portion cavernous hypophysial semiluna anterior meningeal ophthalmic from the cerebral portion anterior cerebral middle cerebral posterior communicating choroidal one the keratico-tympanic branch ramus keratico-tympanicus tympanic branch is small it enters the tympanic cavity through a minute foramen in the carotid canal and anastomosis is the anterior tympanic branch of the internal maxillary and with the stylomastoid artery two the artery of the pterygoid canal arteria canalis pterygoidae median artery is a small inconstant branch which passes through the pterygoid canal and anastomosis with the branch of the internal maxillary artery three the cavernous branches are numerous small vessels which supply the hypophysis the semilunar ganglion and the walls of the cavernous and inferior petrosal sinuses some of them anastomosis branches of the middle meningeal four the hypophysial branches are one or two minute vessels supplying the hypophysis five the semilunar branches are small vessels to the semilunar ganglion six the anterior meningeal branch arteria meningia anterior is a small branch which passes over the small wing of the sphenoid to supply the dura mater of the anterior cranial fossa it anastomosis with the meningeal branch from the posterior ethmoidal artery seven the ophthalmic artery arteria ophthalmica arises from the internal carotid just as that vessel is emerging from the cavernous sinus on the medial side of the interior clinoid process and enters the orbital cavity through the optic foramen below and lateral to the optic nerve it then passes over the nerve to reach the medial wall of the orbit and thence horizontally forward beneath the lower border of the obliquus superior and divides it into two terminal branches the frontal and the dorsal nasal as the artery crosses the optic nerve it is accompanied by the nasociliary nerve and is separated from the frontal nerve by the rectus superior and the levator palpebrae superioris branches the branches of the ophthalmic artery may be divided into an orbital group distributed to the orbit and the surrounding parts and an ocular group to the muscles and bulb of the eye orbital group lacrimal supraorbital posterior ethmoidal anterior ethmoidal medial palpebral frontal dorsal nasal ocular group central artery of the retina short posterior ciliary long posterior ciliary anterior ciliary muscular the lacrimal artery arteria lacrimalis arises from the optic foramen and is one of the largest branches derived from the ophthalmic not infrequently it is given off before the artery enters the orbit it accompanies the lacrimal nerve along the upper border of the rectus lateralis and supplies the lacrimal gland its terminal branches escaping from the gland are distributed to the eyelids and conjunctiva of those supplying the eyelids two are of considerable size and are named the lateral palpebral arteries they run medial ward in the upper and lower lids respectively and anastomose with the medial palpebral arteries forming an arterial circle in its situation the lacrimal artery give off one or two psychomatic branches one of which passes through the psychomatico temporal foramen to reach the temporal fossa and anastomosis with the deep temporal arteries another appears on the cheek through the psychomatico facial foramen and anastomosis with the transverse facial a recurrent branch passes backward through the lateral part of the superior orbital fissure to the dura mater and anastomosis with the branch of the middle meningeal artery
the lacrimal artery is sometimes derived from one of the anterior branches of the middle meningeal artery and the supraorbital artery arteria supraorbitalis springs from the ophthalmic as that vessel is crossing over the optic nerve it passes upward to the medial borders of the rectus superior and levator palpebrae and meeting the supraorbital nerve accompanies it between the periostrum and levator palpebrae to the supraorbital foramen passing through this it divides into a superficial and a deep branch which supply the integument the muscles and the pericranium of the forehead then is the mosing with the frontal the frontal branch of the superficial temporal and the artery of the opposite side this artery in the orbit supplies the rectus superior and the levator palpebrae and sends a branch across the pulley to the obliquus superior to supply the parts of the medial palpebral commissure at the supraorbital foramen it frequently transmits a branch to the diploe the ethmoidal arteries are two in number posterior and anterior the posterior ethmoidal artery the smaller passes through the posterior ethmoidal canal supplies the posterior ethmoidal cells and entering the cranium gives off a meningeal branch to the dura mater and nasal branches which descend into the nasal cavity through the apertures in the cribriform plate anastomosing with branches of the sphenopalatine the anterior ethmoidal artery accompanies the nasociliary nerve through the anterior ethmoidal canal supplies the anterior middle ethmoidal cells and frontal sinus and entering the cranium gives off a meningeal branch to the dura mater and nasal branches this latter descend into the nasal cavity through the slit by the side of the crista galli and running along the groove on the inner surface of the nasal bone supply branches to the lateral wall and septum of the nose and the terminal branch which appears on the dorsum of the nose between the nasal bone and the lateral cartilage the medial palpebral arteries arteria palpebralis medialis internal palpebral arteries two in number superior and inferior arise from the ophthalmic opposite the pulley of the obliquus superior they leave the orbit to encircle the eyelids near their free margins forming a superior and an inferior arch which lie between the orbicularis oculi and the tarsi the superior palpebral anastomosis at the lateral angle of the orbit is the sagomatical orbital branch of the temporal artery and with the upper two of the two lateral palpebral branches from the lacrimal artery the inferior palpebral anastomosis at the lateral angle of the orbit is the lower of the two lateral palpebral branches from the lacrimal and with the transverse facial artery and at the medial part of the lid is a branch from the angular artery from this last anastomosis a branch passes to the nasolacrimal duct ramifying in its mucous membrane as far as the inferior meatus of the nasal cavity the frontal artery arteria frontalis is one of the terminal branches of the ophthalmic leaves the orbit at its medial angle with the supratrochlear nerve and ascending to the forehead supplies the integument muscles and pericranium anastomosing with the supraorbital artery and with the artery of the opposite side the dorsal nasal artery arteria dorsalis nasi nasal artery the other terminal branch of the ophthalmic emerges from the orbit above the medial palpebral ligament and after giving a twig to the upper part of the lacrimal sac divides into two branches one of which crosses the root of the nose and anastomosis with the angular artery the other runs along the dorsum of the nose supplies its outer surface and anastomosis with the artery of the opposite side and with the lateral nasal branch of the external artery the central artery of the retina arteria centralis retinae is the first and one of the smallest branches of the ophthalmic artery runs for a short distance within the dural sheath of the optic nerve but about two point twenty five centimeter behind the eyeball it pierces the nerve obliquely and runs forward in the center of its substance to the retina its mode of distribution will be described with the anatomy of the eye the ciliary arteries arteria ciliaris are divisible into three groups the long and short posterior and the anterior the short posterior ciliary arteries from six to twelve in number arise from the ophthalmic or its branches they pass forward around the optic nerve to the posterior part of the eyeball pierce the sclera around the entrance of the nerve and supply the choroid and ciliary processes the long posterior ciliary arteries two in number pierce the posterior part of the sclera at some distance from the optic nerve and run forward along either side of the eyeball between the sclera and the choroid to the ciliary muscle where they divide into two branches these form an anterior circle 
the circulus aterioso major around the circumference of the iris from which numerous converging branches run in the substance of the iris to its popillary margin where they form a second arterial circle the circulus aterioso's minor the anterior ciliary arteries are derived from the muscular branches they run to the front of the eye pole in company with the tendons of the recti form a vascular zone beneath the conjunctiva and then pierce the sclera a short distance from the cornea and end in the circulus anteriosus major the muscular branches remi muscularis two in number superior and inferior frequently spring from a common trunk the superior often wanting supplies the levator palpebrae superioris rectus superior and obliquus superior the inferior more constantly present passes forward between the optic nerve and the rectus inferior and is distributed to the recti lateralis medialis and inferior and the obliquus inferior this vessel gives off most of the anterior ciliary arteries additional muscular branches are given off from the lacrimal and the supraorbital arteries or form the trunk of the ophthalmic eight anterior cerebral artery arteria cerebri anterior arises from the internal carotid at the medial extremity of the lateral cerebral fissure it passes forward and medialward across the anterior perforated substance above the optic nerve to the commencement of the longitudinal fissure here it comes into close relationship with the opposite artery to which it is connected by a short trunk the anterior communicating artery from this point the two vessels run side by side in the longitudinal fissure curve around the geno of the corpus callosum and turning backward continue along the upper surface of the corpus callosum to its posterior part where they end by anastomosing with the posterior cerebral arteries branches in its course the anterior cerebral artery gives off the following branches anterior medial ganglionic anterior posterior inferior and middle the anterior medial ganglionic branches form a group of small arteries which arise at the commencement of the anterior cerebral artery they pierce the anterior perforated substance and lamina terminalis and supply the rostrum of the corpus callosum the septum pellucidum and the head of the caudate nucleus the inferior branches two or three in number are distributed to the orbital surface of the frontal lobe where they supply the olfactory lobe gyrus rectus and internal orbital gyrus the anterior branches supply a part of the superior frontal gyrus and send twigs over the edge of the hemisphere to the superior and middle frontal gyri and upper part of the interior central gyrus the middle branches supply the corpus callosum the cingulate gyrus the medial surface of the superior frontal gyrus and the upper part of the interior central gyrus the posterior branches apply the precuneus and the adjacent lateral surface of the hemisphere the anterior communicating artery arterio communicans anterior connects the two anterior cerebral arteries across the commencement of the longitudinal fissure sometimes this vessel is wanting the two arteries joining together to form a single trunk which afterward divides or it may be wholly or partially divided into two its length averages about four millimeters but varies greatly it gives off some of the interomedial ganglionic vessels but these are principally derived from the anterior cerebral nine the middle cerebral artery arteria cerebri media the largest branch of the internal carotid runs at first lateralward in the lateral cerebral or sylvian fissure and then backward and upward to the surface of the insula where it divides into a number of branches which are distributed to the lateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere branches the branches of this vessel are enterolateral ganglionic inferior lateral frontal ascending frontal ascending parietal parietotemporal and temporal the enterolateral ganglionic branches a group of small arteries which arise at the commencement of the middle cerebral artery are arranged in two sets one the internal striate passes upward through the inner segments of the lentiform nucleus and supplies it the caudate nucleus and the internal capsule the other the external striate ascends through the outer segment of the lentiform nucleus and supplies the caudate nucleus and thalamus one artery of this group is of larger size than the rest and is of special importance as being the artery in the brain most frequently ruptured it has been termed by charcot the artery of cerebral hemorrhage it ascends between the lentiform nucleus and the external capsule and ends in the caudate nucleus 
the inferior lateral frontal supplies the inferior frontal gyrus procus convolution and the lateral part of the orbital surface of the frontal lobe the ascending frontal supplies the anterior central gyrus the ascending parietal is distributed to the posterior central gyrus and the lower part of the superior parietal lobule the parieto temporal supplies the supramarginal and the angular gyri the parieto temporal supplies the supramarginal and angular gyri and posterior parts of the superior and middle temporal gyri the temporal branches two or three in number are distributed to the lateral surface of the temporal lobe ten the posterior communicating artery arterial communicans posterior runs backward from the internal carotid and anastomosis with the posterior cerebral a branch of the basilar it varies in size being sometimes small and occasionally so large that the posterior cerebral may be considered as arising from the internal carotid rather than from the basilar it is frequently larger on one side than on the other from its posterior half are given off a number of small branches the posteromedial ganglionic branches which with similar vessels from the posterior cerebral pierce the posterior perforated substance and supply the medial surface of the thalami and the walls of the third ventricle eleven the anterior corridal anterior corridia corrid artery is a small but constant branch which arises from the internal carotid near the posterior communicating artery passing backward and lateralward between the temporal lobe and the cerebral peduncle it enters the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle through the corridal fissure and ends in the corrid plexus it is distributed to the hippocampus fimbria telocoridea of the third ventricle and corrid plexus end of section fifteen recording by Ellie. Section 16 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. The Arteries of the Brain. Since the mode of distribution of the vessels of the brain has an important bearing upon the considerable number of pathological lesions which may occur in this part of the nervous system, it is important to consider a little in more detail the manner in which the vessels are distributed. The cerebral arteries are derived from the internal carotid and vertebral, which at the base of the brain form a remarkable anastomosis known as the arterial circle of Willis. It is formed in front by the anterior cerebral arteries, branches of the internal carotid, which are connected together by the anterior communicating, behind by the two posterior cerebral arteries, branches of the basilar, which are connected on either side with the internal carotid by the posterior communicating. The parts of the brain included within this arterial circle are the lamina terminalis, the optic chiasma, the infundibulum, the tuber cinereum, the corpora mammillaria, and the posterior perforated substance. The three trunks which together supply each cerebral hemisphere arise from the arterial circle of Willis. From its anterior part proceed the two anterior cerebrals, from its anterolateral parts, the middle cerebrals, and from its posterior part, the posterior cerebrals. Each of these principal arteries gives origin to two different systems of secondary vessels. One of these is named the ganglionic system, and the vessels belonging to it supply the thalami and corpora striata. The other is the cortical system, and its vessels ramify in the pia mater and supply the cortex and subadjacent brain substance. These two systems do not communicate at any point of their peripheral distribution, but are entirely independent of each other, and there is between the parts supplied by the two systems a borderland of diminished nutritive activity, where, it is said, softening is especially liable to occur in the brains of old people. The ganglionic system. All the vessels of this system are given off from the arterial circle of Willis, or from the vessels close to it. They form six principal groups. One, the anteromedial group, derived from the anterior cerebrals and anterior communicating. 2. The posterior medial group, from the posterior cerebrals and posterior communicating. 3 and 4. The right and left anterolateral groups, from the middle cerebrals. And 5 and 6. The right and left posterolateral groups, from the posterior cerebrals, after they have wound around the cerebral peduncles. The vessels of this system are larger than those of the cortical system, 
and are what Kolnheim designated terminal arteries, that is to say, vessels from which their origin to their termination neither supply nor receive any anastomotic branch, so that, through any one of the vessels, only a limited area of the thalamus or corpus striatum can be injected, and the injection cannot be driven beyond the area of the part supplied by the particular vessel which is the subject of the experiment. The cortical arterial system. The vessels forming this system are the terminal branches of the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. They divide and ramify in the substance of the pia mater, and give off branches which penetrate the brain cortex perpendicularly. These branches are divisible into two classes, long and short. The long or medullary arteries pass through the gray substance and penetrate the subadjacent white substance to the depth of three or four centimeters, without intercommunicating otherwise than by very fine capillaries, and thus constitute so many independent small systems. The short vessels are confined to the cortex, where they form with the long vessels a compact network in the middle zone of the gray substance, the outer and inner zones being sparingly supplied with blood. The vessels of the cortical arterial system are not so strictly terminal as those of the ganglionic system, but they approach this type very closely, so that injection of one area from the vessel of another area, though possible, is frequently very difficult, and is only effected through vessels of small caliber. As a result of this, obstruction of one of the main branches or its divisions may have the effect of producing softening in a limited area of the cortex. End of section 16. In number 17 of Gray's Anatomy, part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. Arteries of the Upper Extremity, the Subclavian Artery, Part 1. The artery which supplies the upper extremity continues as a single trunk from its commencement down to the elbow, but different portions of it have received different names, according to the regions through which they pass. The part of the vessel which extends from its origin to the outer border of the first rib is termed the subclavian. Beyond this point to the lower border of the axilla, it is named the axillary and from the lower margin of the axillary space to the bend of the elbow it is termed brachial. Here the trunk ends by dividing into two branches, the radial and ulna. The subclavian artery, arteria subclavia. On the right side the subclavian artery arises from the innominate artery behind the right sternoclavicular articulation. On the left side it springs from the arch of the aorta. The two vessels, therefore, in the first part of their course, differ in length, direction, and relation with neighboring structures. In order to facilitate the description, each subclavian artery is divided into three parts. The first portion extends from the origin of the vessel to the medial border of the scalenus anterior, the second lies behind this muscle, and the third extends from the lateral margin of the muscle to the outer border of the first rib, where it becomes the axillary artery. The first portions of the two vessels require separate descriptions. The second and third parts of the two arteries are practically alike. First part of the right subclavian artery. The first part of the right subclavian artery arises from the innominate artery behind the upper part of the right sternoclavicular articulation and passes upward and lateralward to the medial margin of the scalenus anterior. It extends a little above the clavicle the extent to which it does so varying in different cases. Relations. It is covered, in front, by the integument, superficial fascia, platysma, deep fascia, the clavicular origin of the sternocleidomastoideus, the sternohyodeus, and sternothyroideus, and another layer of the deep fascia. It is crossed by the internal jugular and vertebral veins, by the vagus nerve and the cardiac branches of the vagus and sympathetic, and by the subclavian loop of the sympathetic trunk which forms a ring around the vessel. The anterior jugular vein is directed lateralward in front of the artery, but is separated from it by the sternohyodeus and sternothyroideus. Below and behind the artery is the pleura, which separates it from the apex of the lung. Behind is the sympathetic trunk, 
the longus colli, and the first thoracic vertebra. The right recurrent nerve winds around the lower and back part of the vessel. First part of the left subclavian artery. The first part of the left subclavian artery arises from the arch of the aorta, behind the left common carotid, and at the level of the fourth thoracic vertebra. It ascends in the superior mediastinal cavity to the root of the neck, and then arches lateralward to the medial border of the scalenus anterior. Relations. It is in relation, in front, with the vagus, cardiac, and phrenic nerves, which lie parallel with it. The left common carotid artery, left internal jugular and vertebral veins, and the commencement of the left innominate vein, and is covered by the sternothyroideus, sternohyoideus, and sternocleidomastoideus. Behind, it is in relation with the esophagus, thoracic duct, left recurrent nerve, inferior cervical ganglion of the sympathetic trunk, and longus colli. Higher up, however, the esophagus and thoracic duct lie to its right side, the latter ultimately arching over the vessel to join the angle of union between the subclavian and internal jugular veins. Medial to it are the esophagus, trachea, thoracic duct and left recurrent nerve. Lateral to it, the left pleura and lung. Second and third parts of the subclavian artery. The second portion of the subclavian artery lies behind the scalenus anterior. It is very short, and forms the highest part of the arch described by the vessel. Relations. It is covered in front by the skin, superficial fascia, platysma, deep cervical fascia, sternocleidomastoideus, and scalenus anterior. On the right side of the neck, the phrenic nerve is separated from the second part of the artery by the scalenus anterior, while on the left side it crosses the first part of the artery close to the medial edge of the muscle. Behind the vessel are the pleura and the scalenus medius, above the brachial plexus of nerves, below the pleura. The subclavian vein lies below and in front of the artery, separated from it by the scalenus anterior. The third portion of the subclavian artery runs downward and lateralward from the lateral margin of the scalenus anterior to the outer border of the first rib, where it becomes the axillary artery. This is the most superficial portion of the vessel, and is contained in the subclavian triangle. Relations It is covered in front by the skin, the superficial fascia, the platysma, the supraclavicular nerves, and the deep cervical fascia. The external jugular vein crosses its medial part and receives the transverse scapular, transverse cervical, and anterior jugular veins, which frequently form a plexus in front of the artery. Behind the veins, the nerve to the subclavius descends in front of the artery. The terminal part of the artery lies behind the clavicle and the subclavius, and is crossed by the transverse scapular vessels. The subclavian vein is in front of and at a slightly lower level than the artery. Behind, it lies on the lowest trunk of the brachial plexus, which intervenes between it and the scalenus medius. Above and to its lateral side are the upper trunks of the brachial plexus and the omohyoideus. Below, it rests on the upper surface of the first rib. Peculiarities The subclavian arteries vary in their origin, their course, and the height to which they rise in the neck. The origin of the right subclavian from the innominate takes place, in some cases, above the sternoclavicular articulation, and occasionally, but less frequently, below that joint. The artery may arise as a separate trunk from the arch of the aorta, and in such cases it may be either the first, second, third, or even the last branch derived from that vessel. In the majority, however, it is the first or last, rarely the second or third. When it is the first branch, it occupies the ordinary position of the innominate artery. When the second or third, it gains its unusual position by passing behind the right carotid. And when the last branch, it arises from the left extremity of the arch, and passes obliquely toward the right side usually behind the trachea, esophagus, and right carotid, sometimes between the esophagus and trachea, to the upper border of the first rib, whence it follows its ordinary course. In very rare instances, this vessel arises from the thoracic aorta, as low down as the fourth thoracic vertebra. Occasionally it perforates the scalenus anterior. More rarely it passes in front of that muscle. Sometimes the subclavian vein passes with the artery behind the scalenus anterior. 
the artery may ascend as high as four centimetres above the clavicle, or any intermediate point between this and the upper border of the bone, the right subclavian usually ascending higher than the left. The left subclavian is occasionally joined at its origin with the left carotid. The left subclavian artery is more deeply placed than the right in the first part of its course, and, as a rule, does not reach quite as high a level in the neck. The posterior border of the sternocleidomastoideus corresponds pretty closely to the lateral border of the scalenus anterior, so that the third portion of the artery, the part most accessible for operation, lies immediately lateral to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoideus. Collateral Circulation After ligature of the third part of the subclavian artery, the collateral circulation is established mainly by three sets of vessels, thus described in a dissection. 1 a posterior set, consisting of the transverse scapula and the descending ramus of the transverse cervical branches of the subclavian, and astomosing with the subscapula from the axillary. 2. A medial set, produced by the connection of the internal mammary on the one hand with the highest intercostal and lateral thoracic arteries, and the branches from the subscapula on the other. 3. A middle or axillary set, consisting of a number of small vessels derived from branches of the subclavian, above, and passing through the axilla, terminating either in the main trunk, or some of the branches of the axillary below. This last set presented most conspicuously the peculiar character of newly formed, or rather dilated arteries, being excessively tortuous and forming a complete plexus. The chief agent in the restoration of the axillary artery below the tumour was the subscapular artery, which communicated most freely with the internal mammary, transverse scapula and descending ramus of the transverse cervical branches of the subclavian, from all of which it received so great an influx of blood as to dilate it to three times its natural size. Footnote Guy's Hospital Reports, Volume 1, 1836 Case of Axillary Aneurysm, in which Aston Key had tied the subclavian artery on the lateral edge of the scalenus anterior twelve years previously. End of footnote when a ligature is applied to the first part of the subclavian artery, the collateral circulation is carried on by 1. The anastomosis between the superior and inferior thyroids 2. The anastomosis of the two vertebrals 3. The anastomosis of the internal mammary with the inferior epigastric and the aortic intercostals 4. The costocervical anastomosing with the aortic intercostals 5. The profunda cervicis anastomosing with the descending branch of the occipital. 6. The scapular branches of the thyrocervical trunk anastomosing with the branches of the axillary. And 7. The thoracic branches of the axillary anastomosing with the aortic intercostals. Branches. The branches of the subclavian artery are vertebral, thyrocervical, internal mammary, costocervical. On the left side, all four branches generally arise from the first portion of the vessel, but on the right side, the costocervical trunk usually springs from the second portion of the vessel. On both sides of the neck, the first three branches arise close together at the medial border of the scalenus anterior, in the majority of cases. A free interval of from 1.25 to 2.5 centimetres exists between the commencement of the artery and the origin of the nearest branch. 1. The vertebral artery, arteria vertebralis, is the first branch of the subclavian and arises from the upper and back part of the first portion of the vessel. It is surrounded by a plexus of nerve fibres derived from the inferior cervical ganglion of the sympathetic trunk and ascends through the foramina in the transverse processes of the upper six cervical vertebrae. Footnote the vertebral artery sometimes enters the foramen in the transverse process of the fifth vertebra, and has been seen entering that of the seventh vertebra. End of footnote. It then winds behind the superior articular process of the atlas and, entering the skull through the foramen magnum, unites, at the lower border of the pons, with the vessel of the opposite side to form the basilar artery. Relations. The vertebral artery may be divided into four parts. The first part runs upward and backward between the longus colli and the scalenus anterior. In front of it are the internal jugular and vertebral veins, and it is crossed by the inferior thyroid artery. The left vertebral is crossed by the thoracic duct also.
Behind it are the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra, the sympathetic trunk, and its inferior cervical ganglion. The second part runs upward through the foramina in the transverse processes of the upper six cervical vertebrae, and is surrounded by branches from the inferior cervical sympathetic ganglion and by a plexus of veins which unite to form the vertebral vein at the lower part of the neck. It is situated in front of the trunks of the cervical nerves and pursues an almost vertical course as far as the transverse process of the atlas, above which it runs upward and lateralward to the foramen in the transverse process of the atlas. The third part issues from the latter foramen on the medial side of the rectus capitis lateralis and curves backward behind the superior articular process of the atlas, the anterior ramus of the first cervical nerve being on its medial side. It then lies in the groove on the upper surface of the posterior arch of the atlas, and enters the vertebral canal by passing between the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. This part of the artery is covered by the semispinalis capitis, and is contained in the suboccipital triangle, a triangular space bounded by the rectus capitis posterior major, the obliquus superior, and the obliquus inferior. The first cervical or suboccipital nerve lies between the artery and the posterior arch of the atlas. The fourth part pierces the dura mater and inclines medialward to the front of the medulla oblongata. It is placed between the hypoglossal nerve and the anterior root of the first cervical nerve and beneath the first digitation of the ligamentum denticulatum. At the lower border of the pons it unites with the vessel of the opposite side to form the basilar artery. Branches the branches of the vertebral artery may be divided into two sets, those given off at the neck and those within the cranium. Cervical branch, spinal, cranial branches, meningeal. Cervical branch, muscular, cranial branches, posterior spinal, anterior spinal, posterior inferior cerebellar, medullary. Spinal branches, rami spinalis enter the vertebral canal through the intervertebral foramina and each divides into two branches. Of these, one passes along the roots of the nerves to supply the medulla spinalis and its membranes, anastomosing with the other arteries of the medulla spinalis. The other divides into an ascending and a descending branch, which unite with similar branches from the arteries above and below, so that two lateral anastomotic chains are formed on the posterior surfaces of the bodies of the vertebrae, near the attachment of the pedicles. From these anastomotic chains, branches are supplied to the periosteum and the bodies of the vertebrae, and others form communications with similar branches from the opposite side. From these communications, small twigs arise which join similar branches above and below, to form a central anastomotic chain on the posterior surface of the bodies of the vertebrae. Muscular branches are given off to the deep muscles of the neck, where the vertebral artery curves around the articular process of the atlas. They anastomose with the occipital and with the ascending and deep cervical arteries. The meningeal branch, ramus meningeus, posterior meningeal branch, springs from the vertebral opposite the foramen magnum, ramifies between the bone and dura mater in the cerebellar fossa, and supplies the fox cerebelli. It is frequently represented by one or two small branches. The posterior spinal artery, a spinalis posterior, dorsal spinal artery, arises from the vertebral, at the side of the medulla oblongata. Passing backward, it descends on this structure, lying in front of the posterior roots of the spinal nerves, and is reinforced by a succession of small branches, which enter the vertebral canal through the intervertebral foramina. By means of these, it is continued to the lower part of the medulla spinalis, and to the corda equina. Branches from the posterior spinal arteries form a free anastomosis around the posterior roots of the spinal nerves, and communicate, by means of very tortuous transverse branches, with the vessels of the opposite side. Close to its origin, each gives off an ascending branch, which ends at the side of the fourth ventricle. The anterior spinal artery. Arteria spinalis anterior, ventral spinal artery is a small branch which arises near the termination of the vertebral and, descending in front of the medulla oblongata, unites with its fellow of the opposite side at the level of the foramen magnum. One of these vessels is usually larger than the other, but occasionally they are about equal in size. The single trunk, thus formed, descends on the front of the medulla spinalis and is reinforced by a succession of small branches which enter the vertebral canal through the intervertebral foramina,
These branches are derived from the vertebral and the ascending cervical of the inferior thyroid at the neck, from the intercostalis in the thorax, and from the lumbar, iliolumbar, and lateral sacral arteries in the abdomen and pelvis. They unite by means of ascending and descending branches to form a single anterior median artery, which extends as far as the lower part of the medulla spinalis, and is continued as a slender twig on the filum terminale. This vessel is placed in the pia mater along the anterior median fissure. It supplies that membrane and the substance of the medulla spinalis, and sends off branches at its lower part to be distributed to the corda equina. The posterior inferior cerebellar artery, arterio cerebelli inferior posterior, the largest branch of the vertebral, winds backward around the upper part of the medulla oblongata, passing between the origins of the vagus and accessory nerves, over the inferior peduncle to the undersurface of the cerebellum, where it divides into two branches. The medial branch is continued backward to the notch between the two hemispheres of the cerebellum, while the lateral supplies the undersurface of the cerebellum. As far as its lateral border, where it anastomoses with the anterior inferior cerebellar and the superior cerebellar branches of the basilar artery, branches from this artery supply the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. The medullary arteries, bulba arteries, are several minute vessels which spring from the vertebral and its branches and are distributed to the medulla oblongata. End of section number 17. Of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3 by Henry Gray. The Subclavian Artery, Part 2. The basilar artery, Arteria basilaris, so named from its position at the base of the skull, is a single trunk formed by the junction of the two vertebral arteries. It extends from the lower to the upper border of the pons, lying in its median groove under cover of the arachnoid. It ends by dividing into the two posterior cerebral arteries. Its branches on either side are the following. Pontine, anterior inferior cerebellar, internal auditory, superior cerebellar, Posterior cerebral. The pontine branches, rami ad pontem, transverse branches, are a number of small vessels which come off at right angles from either side of the basilar artery and supply the pons and adjacent parts of the brain. The internal auditory artery, arterius auditiva interna, auditory artery, a long slender branch, arises from near the middle of the artery. It accompanies the acoustic nerve through the internal acoustic meatus and is distributed to the internal ear. The anterior inferior cerebellar artery, arterius cerebelli inferior anterior, passes backward to be distributed to the anterior part of the undersurface of the cerebellum, anastomosing with the posterior inferior cerebellar branch of the vertebral. The superior cerebellar artery, arterius cerebelli superior, arises near the termination of the basilar. It passes lateralward immediately below the oculomotor nerve, which separates it from the posterior cerebral artery, winds around the cerebral peduncle close to the trochlear nerve, and, arriving at the upper surface of the cerebellum, divides into branches which ramify in the pia mater and anastomose with those of the inferior cerebellar arteries. Several branches are given to the pineal body. The anterior medullary vellum and the telechoroidea of the third ventricle. The posterior cerebral artery, arteria cerebri posterior, is larger than the preceding, from which it is separated near its origin by the oculomotor nerve. Passing lateralward, parallel to the superior cerebellar artery, and receiving the posterior, communicating from the internal carotid, it winds around the cerebral peduncle and reaches the tentorial surface of the occipital lobe of the cerebrum, where it breaks up into branches for the supply of the, the temporal and occipital lobes. The branches of the posterior cerebral artery are divided into two sets, ganglionic and cortical. Ganglionic, posterior medial, posterior choroidal, posterolateral, cortical anterior temporal, posterior temporal, calcarine, 
parieter occipital. Ganglionic. The posteromedial ganglionic branches are a group of small arteries which arise at the commencement of the posterior cerebral artery. These, with similar branches from the posterior communicating, pierce the posterior perforated substance and supply the medial surfaces of the thalami and the walls of the third ventricle. Posterior choroidal branches run forward beneath the splenium of the corpus callosum and supply the telechoroidea of the third ventricle and the choroid plexus. The posterolateral ganglionic branches are small arteries which arise from the posterior cerebral artery after it has turned around the cerebral peduncle. They supply a considerable portion of the thalamus. Cortical. The cortical branches are the anterior temporal, distributed to the uncus and the anterior part of the fusiform gyrus, the posterior temporal, to the fusiform and the inferior temporal gyri, the calcarine, to the cuneus and gyrus lingualis and the back part of the convex surface of the occipital lobe, and the parieto occipital, to the cuneus and the precuneus. 2. The thyrocervical trunk, truncus thyrocervicalis, thyroid axis is a short, thick trunk which arises from the front of the first portion of the subclavian artery, close to the medial border of the scalenus anterior, and divides almost immediately into three branches, the inferior thyroid, transverse scapula, and transverse cervical. The inferior thyroid artery, arteria thyroidea inferior, passes upward in front of the vertebral artery and longus colli, then turns medialward behind the carotid sheath and its contents and also behind the sympathetic trunk, the middle cervical ganglion resting upon the vessel. Reaching the lower border of the thyroid gland, it divides into two branches, which supply the postero-inferior parts of the gland, and anastomose with the superior thyroid and with the corresponding artery of the opposite side. The recurrent nerve passes upward generally behind, but occasionally in front of the artery. The branches of the inferior thyroid are inferior laryngeal, tracheal, esophageal, ascending cervical, muscular. The inferior laryngeal artery, arteria laryngea inferior, ascends upon the trachea to the back part of the larynx under cover of the constrictor pharyngus inferior, in company with the recurrent nerve, and supplies the muscles and mucous membrane of this part, anastomosing with the branch from the opposite side and with the superior laryngeal branch of the superior thyroid artery. The tracheal branches, Rami tracheales are distributed upon the trachea and anastomose below with the bronchial arteries. The esophageal branches, Rami esophagi, supply the esophagus and anastomose with the esophageal branches of the aorta. The ascending cervical artery, arteria cervicalis ascendens, is a small branch which arises from the inferior thyroid as that vessel is passing behind the carotid sheath. It runs up on the anterior tubercles of the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae in the interval between the scalenus anterior and longus capitis. To the muscles of the neck it gives twigs which anastomose with branches of the vertebral, and it sends one or two spinal branches into the vertebral canal through the intervertebral foramina to be distributed to the medulla spinalis and its membranes, and to the bodies of the vertebrae in the same manner as the spinal branches from the vertebral. It anastomoses with the ascending pharyngeal and occipital arteries. The muscular branches supply the depressors of the hyoid bone and the longus colli, scalenus anterior and constrictor pharyngus inferior. The transverse scapular artery, arteria transversa scapulae suprascapular artery, passes at first downward and lateralward across the scalenus anterior and phrenic nerve, being covered by the sternocleidomastoideus. It then crosses the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus, and runs behind and parallel with the clavicle and the subclavius, and beneath the inferior belly of the omohyodeus, to the superior border of the scapula. It passes over the superior transverse ligament of the scapula, which separates it from the suprascapular nerve, and enters the supraspinatus fossa. In this situation it lies close to the bone, and ramifies between it and the supraspinatus, to which it supplies branches. It then descends behind the neck of the scapula, through the great scapular notch and under cover of the inferior transverse ligament, to reach the infraspinatus fossa, where it anastomoses with the scapular circumflex and the descending branch of the transverse cervical. Besides distributing branches to the sternocleidomastoideus, subclavius and neighboring muscles, it gives off a suprasternal branch 
which crosses over the sternal end of the clavicle to the skin of the upper part of the chest, and an acromial branch, which pierces the trapezius and supplies the skin over the acromion, anastomosing with the thoracoacromial artery. As the artery passes over the superior transverse ligament of the scapula, it sends a branch into the subscapular fossa, where it ramifies beneath the subscapularis, and anastomoses with the subscapular artery, and with the descending branch of the transverse cervical. It also sends articular branches to the acromioclavicular and shoulder joints, and a nutrient artery to the clavicle. The transverse cervical artery, arteria transversa colli, transversalis colli artery, lies at a higher level than the transverse scapula. It passes transversely above the inferior belly of the homohyodeus to the anterior margin of the trapezius, beneath which it divides into an ascending and a descending branch. It crosses in front of the phrenic nerve and the scalene, and in front of or between the divisions of the brachial plexus, and is covered by the platysma and sternocleidomastoideus, and crossed by the homohyodeus and trapezius. The ascending branch, ramus ascendens, superficial cervical artery, ascends beneath the anterior margin of the trapezius, distributing branches to it, and to the neighbouring muscles and lymph glands in the neck, and anastomosing with the superficial branch of the descending ramus of the occipital artery. The descending branch, ramus descendens, posterior scapular artery, passes beneath the levator scapulae to the medial angle of the scapula, and then descends under the rhomboidae along the vertebral border of that bone as far as the inferior angle. It supplies the rhomboidae, latissimus dorsi, and trapezius, and anastomosis with the transverse scapular and subscapular arteries, and with the posterior branches of some of the intercostal arteries. Peculiarities The ascending branch of the transverse cervical frequently arises directly from the thyrocervical trunk, and the descending branch from the third, more rarely from the second, part of the subclavian. The internal mammary artery, arteria mammaria interna, arises from the undersurface of the first portion of the subclavian, opposite the thyrocervical trunk. It descends behind the cartilages of the upper six ribs at a distance of about 1.25 centimetres from the margin of the sternum, and at the level of the sixth intercostal space divides into the muscular phrenic and superior epigastric arteries. Relations It is directed at first downward, forward, and medialward behind the sternal end of the clavicle the subclavian and internal jugular veins, and the first costal cartilage, and passes forward close to the lateral side of the innominate vein. As it enters the thorax, the phrenic nerve crosses from its lateral to its medial side. Below the first costal cartilage, it descends almost vertically to its point of bifurcation. It is covered in front by the cartilages of the upper six ribs, and the intervening intercostales interni and anterior intercostal membranes and is crossed by the terminal portions of the upper six intercostal nerves. It rests on the pleura, as far as the third costal cartilage, below this level upon the transversus thoracis. It is accompanied by a pair of veins. These unite above to form a single vessel, which runs medial to the artery and ends in the corresponding innominate vein. Branches The branches of the internal mammary are pericardiacophrenic, anterior mediastinal, pericardial, sternal, intercostal, perforating, musculophrenic, superior epigastric. The pericardiacophrenic artery, arteria pericardiacophrenica, arteria comes nervi phrenici, is a long slender branch which accompanies the phrenic nerve between the pleura and pericardium to the diaphragm to which it is distributed. It anastomoses with the musculophrenic and inferior phrenic arteries. The anterior mediastinal arteries, A.A. mediastinalis anteriores, mediastinal arteries, are small vessels distributed to the areolar tissue and lymph glands in the anterior mediastinal cavity and to the remains of the thymus. The pericardial branches supply the upper part of the anterior surface of the pericardium. The lower part receives branches from the musculophrenic artery. The sternal branches, rami sternalis, are distributed to the transversus thoracis and to the posterior surface of the sternum. The anterior mediastinal, pericardial and sternal branches, together with some twigs from the pericardiacophrenic, anastomose with branches from the intercostal and bronchial arteries and form a subplural mediastinal plexus. The intercostal branches, rami intercostales, anterior intercostal arteries, 
supply the upper five or six intercostal spaces. Two in number in each space, these small vessels pass lateral wood, one lying near the lower margin of the rib above, and the other near the upper margin of the rib below, and anastomosed with the intercostal arteries from the aorta. They are at first situated between the pleura and the intercostales interni, and then between the intercostales interni and externi. They supply the intercostales, and by branches which perforate the intercostales externi, the pectorales and the mamma. The perforating branches, remi perforantes, correspond to the five or six intercostal spaces. They pass forward through the intercostal spaces and, curving lateralward, supply the pectoralis major and the integument. Those which correspond to the second, third and fourth spaces give branches to the mamma and during lactation are of large size. The musculophrenic artery, arteria musculophrenica, is directed obliquely downward and lateralward, behind the cartilages of the false ribs. It perforates the diaphragm at the eighth or ninth costal cartilage and ends, considerably reduced in size, opposite the last intercostal space. It gives off intercostal branches to the seventh, eighth and ninth intercostal spaces. These diminish in size as the spaces decrease in length, and are distributed in a manner precisely similar to the intercostals from the internal mammary. The muscular phrenic also gives branches to the lower part of the pericardium, and others which run backward to the diaphragm and downward to the abdominal muscles. The superior epigastric artery, arteria epigastrica superior, continues in the original direction of the internal mammary. It descends to the interval between the costal and sternal attachments of the diaphragm, and enters the sheath of the rectus abdominis, at first lying behind the muscle, and then perforating and supplying it, and anastomosing with the inferior epigastric artery from the external iliac. Branches perforate the anterior wall of the sheath of the rectus, and supply the muscles of the abdomen and the integument, and a small branch passes in front of the xiphoid process and anastomoses with the artery of the opposite side. It also gives some twigs to the diaphragm, while from the artery of the right side small branches extend into the falciform ligament of the liver, and anastomose with the hepatic artery. The cervical trunk, truncus costico-cervicalis, superior intercostal artery, arises from the upper and back part of the subclavian artery, behind the scalenus anterior on the right side, and medial to that muscle on the left side. Passing backward, it gives off the profunda cervicalis, and, continuing as the highest intercostal artery, descends behind the pleura in front of the necks of the first and second ribs, and anastomoses with the first aortic intercostal. As it crosses the neck of the first rib, it lies medial to the anterior division of the first thoracic nerve, and lateral to the first thoracic ganglion of the sympathetic trunk. In the first intercostal space, it gives off a branch which is distributed in a manner similar to the distribution of the aortic intercostals. The branch for the second intercostal space usually joins with one from the highest aortic intercostal artery. This branch is not constant, but is more commonly found on the right side. When absent, its place is supplied by an intercostal branch from the aorta. Each intercostal gives off a posterior branch, which goes to the posterior vertebral muscles, and sends a small spinal branch through the corresponding intervertebral foramen to the medulla spinalis and its membranes. The profunda cervicalis, arteria cervicalis profunda, deep cervical branch, arises in most cases from the costa cervical trunk, and is analogous to the posterior branch of an aortic intercostal artery. Occasionally it is a separate branch from the subclavian artery. Passing backward, above the eighth cervical nerve and between the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra and the neck of the first rib, it runs up the back of the neck, between the semispinalis cavitis and colli, as high as the axis vertebra, supplying these and adjacent muscles, and anastomosing with the deep division of the descending branch of the occipital and with branches of the vertebral. It gives off a spinal twig which enters the canal through the intervertebral foramen between the seventh cervical and first thoracic vertebra. End of section 18. Nineteen of Case Anatomy Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3 by Henry Gray. The axilla, the axillary artery. 4b, the axilla. The axilla is a pyramidal space situated between the upper lateral part of the chest and the medial side of the arm. 
boundaries the apex which is directed upward toward the root of the neck corresponds to the interval between the outer border of the first rib the superior border of the scapula and the posterior surface of the clavicle and through it the axillary vessels and nerves pass the base directed downward is broad at the chest but narrow and pointed at the arm it is formed by the integument and the thick layer of the fascia the axillary fascia extending between the lower border of the pectoralis major in front and the lower border of the latissimus dorsi behind the interior wall is formed by the pectoralis major and minor the former covering the whole of this wall and the latter only its central part the space between the upper border of the pectoralis minor and the clavicle is occupied by the coracoclavicular fascia the posterior wall which extends somewhat lower than the interior is formed by the subscapularis above the teres major and the latissimus dorsi below on the medial side are the first four ribs with their corresponding intercostals and part of the serratus anterior on the lateral side where the anterior and posterior walls converge the space is narrow and bounded by the humerus the coracobrachialis and the biceps brachii contents it contains the axillary vessels and the brachial plexus of nerves with their branches some branches of the intercostal nerves together with the quantity of fat and loose areolar tissue the axillary artery and vein with the brachial plexus of nerves extend obliquely along the lateral boundary of the axilla from its apex to its base and are placed much nearer to the anterior than the posterior wall the vein lying to the thoracic side of the artery and partially concealing it at the fore part of the axilla in contact with the pectoralis are the thoracic branches of the axillary artery and along the lower margin of the pectoralis minor the lateral thoracic artery extends to the side of the chest at the back part in contact with the lower margin of the subscapularis are the subscapular vessels and nerves winding around the lateral border of this muscle are the scapular circumflex vessels and close to the neck of the humerus the posterior humeral circumflex vessels and the axillary nerve curved backward to the shoulder along the medial or thoracic side no vessel of importance exists the upper part of the space being crossed merely by a few small branches from the highest thoracic artery there are some important nerves however in this situation wise the long thoracic nerve descending on the surface of the serratus anterior to which it is distributed and the intercostobrachial nerve perforating the upper and interior part of this wall and passing across the axilla to the medial side of the arm the position and arrangement of the lymph glands are described on pages six hundred ninety nine and seven hundred one the axillary artery the continuation of the subclavian commences at the outer border of the first rib and ends at the lower border of the tendon of the teres major where it takes the name of brachial its direction varies with the position of the limb thus the vessel is nearly straight when the arm is directed at right angles with the trunk concave upward when the arm is elevated above this and convex upward and lateralward when the arm lies by the side at its origin the artery is very deeply situated but near its termination is superficial being covered only by the skin and fascia to facilitate the description of the vessel it is divided into three portions the first part lies above the second behind and the third below the pectoralis minor relations the first portion of the axillary artery is covered anteriorly by the clavicular portion of the pectoralis major and the coracoclavicular fascia and is crossed by the lateral anterior thoracic nerve and the thoracic or chromial and cephalic veins posterior to it are the first intercostal space the corresponding intercostalis externus the first and second digitations of the serratus anterior and the long thoracic and medial anterior thoracic nerves and the medial cord of the brachial plexus on its lateral side is the brachial plexus from which it is separated by little areolar tissue on its medial or thoracic side is the axillary vein which overlaps the artery it is enclosed together with the axillary vein and the brachial plexus in a fibrous sheath the axillary sheath continuous above is the deep cervical fascia the second portion of the axillary artery is covered anteriorly by the pectoralis major and minor posterior to it are the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and some areolar tissue which intervenes between it and the subscapularis on the medial side is the axillary vein separated from the artery by the medial cord of the brachial plexus and the medial anterior thoracic nerve on the lateral side 
is the lateral chord of the brachial plexus brachial plexus thus surrounds the artery on three sides and separates it from direct contact with the vein and adjacent muscles the third portion of the axillary artery extends from the lower border of the pectoralis minor to the lower border of the tendon of the teres major in front it is covered by the lower part of the pectoralis major above but only by the integument and fascia below behind it is in relation with the lower part of the subscopularis and the tendons of the latissimus torsi and the teres major on its lateral side is the coracobrachialis and on its medial or thoracic side the axillary vein the nerves of the brachial plexus bear the following relations to this part of the artery on the lateral side are the lateral head and the trunk of the median and the musculocutaneous for a short distance on the medial side the ulna between the vein and the artery and the medial brachial cutaneous on the medial side of the vein in front are the medial head of the median and the medial antibrachial cutaneous and behind the radial and axillary the latter only as far as the lower border of the subscapularis collateral circulation of the ligature of the axillary artery if the artery be tied above the origin of the thoracor chromia the collateral circulation will be carried on by the same branches as after the ligature on the third part of the subclavian if at the lower point between the thoracor chromia and the subscapular the lateral vessel by its free anastomosis with the transverse scapula and the transverse cervical branches of the subclavian will become the chief agent in carrying on the circulation the lateral thoracic if it be below the ligature will materially contribute by its anastomosis with the intercostal and internal mammary arteries if the point included in the ligature is below the origin of the subscapular artery it will most probably also be below the origins of the two humeral circumflex arteries the chief agents in restoring the circulations will then be the subscapular and the two humeral circumflex arteries anastomosing with the arteria profunda brachii branches branches of the maxillary are from first part highest thoracic from second part thoracocromial lateral thoracic from third part subscapular posterior humeral circumflex anterior humeral circumflex one the highest thoracic artery arteria thoracalis suprema superior thoracic artery is a small vessel which may arise from the thoracocromial running forward and medialward along the upper border of the pectoralis minor it passes between it and the pectoralis major to the side of the chest it supplies branches to these muscles and to the parties of the thorax and anastomosis with the internal mammary and intercostal arteries two the thoracocromial artery arterio thoracocromialis a chromiothoracic artery thoracic axis is a short trunk which arises from the forepart of the axillary artery its origin being generally overlapped by the upper edge of the pectoralis minor projecting forward to the upper border of this muscle it pierces the coracoclavicular fascia and divides it into four branches pectoral acromial clavicular and deltoid the pectoral branch descends between the two pectoralis and is distributed to them and to the mamma anastomosing with the intercostal branches of the internal mammary and with the lateral thoracic the acromial branch runs lateral ward over the coracoid process and under the deltoideas to which it gives branches it then pierces the muscle and ends in the acromium in an arterial network formed by branches from the transverse scapula thoracocromial and posterior humeral circumflex arteries the clavicular branch runs upward and medialward to the sternoclavicular joint supplying this articulation and the subclavius the deltoid humeral branch often arising with the acromial crosses over the pectoralis minor and passes in the same groove as the cephalic vein between the pectoralis major and deltoideus and gives branches to both muscles three the lateral thoracic artery arteria thoracalis lateralis long thoracic artery external mammary artery follows the lower border of the pectoralis minor to the side of the chest supplying the serratus anterior and the pectoralis and sending branches across the axilla to the axillary glands and the subscapularis it anastomoses with the internal mammary subscapular and intercostal arteries and with the pectoral branch of the thoracocromial in the female it supplies the external mammary branch which turns around the free edge of the pectoralis major and supplies the mamma four the subscapular artery arteria subscapularis 
the largest branch of the axillary artery arises at the lower border of the subscapularis which it follows to the inferior angle of the scapula where it anastomoses with the lateral thoracic and intercostal arteries and with the descending branch of the transverse cervical and ends in the neighboring muscles about four centimeters from its origin it gives off a branch the scapular circumflex artery the scapular circumflex artery arterial circumflexa scapulae dorsalis scapulae artery is generally larger than the continuation of the subscapula it curves around the axillary border of the scapula transversing the space between the subscapularis above teres major below and the long head of the triceps laterally it enters the infraspinatus fossa under cover of the teres minor and anastomosis with the transverse scapular artery and the descending branch of the transverse cervical in its course it gives off two branches one infrascapular enters the subscapular fossa beneath the subscapularis which it supplies anastomosing with the transverse scapular artery and the descending branch of the transverse cervical the other is continued along the axillary border of the scapula between the teres major and minor and at the dorsal surface of the inferior angle anastomosis with the descending branch of the transverse cervical in addition to these small branches are distributed to the back part of the deltoideus and the long head of the triceps brachii anastomosing with the ascending branch of the arterio profunda brachii five the posterior humeral circumflex artery arterio circumflexo humeri posterior posterior circumflex artery arises from the axillary artery at the lower border of the subscapularis and runs backward with the axillary nerve through the quadrangular space bounded by the subscapularis and teres minor above the teres major below the long head or the triceps brachii medially the surgical neck of the humerus laterally it winds around the neck of the humerus and is distributed to the deltoideus and shoulder joint anastomosing with the anterior humeral circumflex and profunda brachii six the anterior humeral circumflex artery arterial circumflex or humeri anterior anterior circumflex artery considerably smaller than the posterior arises nearly opposite it from the lateral side of the axillary artery it runs horizontally beneath the coracobrachialis and short head of the biceps brachii in front of the neck of the humerus on reaching the intertubercular sulcus it gives off a branch which ascends the sulcus to supply the head of the humerus and the shoulder joint the trunk of the vessel is then continued onward beneath the long head of the biceps brachii and the deltoideus and anastomosis with the posterior humeral circumflex artery peculiarities the branches of the axillary artery vary considerably in different subjects occasionally the subscapular humeral circumflex and profunda arteries arise from a common trunk and when this occurs the branches of the brachial plexus surround this trunk instead of the main vessel sometimes the axillary artery divides into the radial and ulnar arteries and occasionally it gives origin to the volla interossus artery of the forearm end of section nineteen recording by ellie august two thousand and nine of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. The Brachial Artery. 4B2 the brachial artery a brachialis the brachial artery commences at the lower margin of the tendon of the teres major and passing down the arm ends about one centimeter below the bend of the elbow where it divides into the radial and ulnar arteries at first the brachial artery lies medial to the humerus but as it runs down the arm it gradually gets in front of the bone and at the bend of the elbow it lies midway between its two epicondyles. Relations The artery is superficial throughout its entire extent, being covered in front by the integument and the superficial and deep fascia. The lacertus fibrosus, bicipital fascia, lies in front of it opposite the elbow and separates it from the vena mediana cubitae, 
the median nerve crosses from its lateral to its medial side opposite the insertion of the coracobrachialis. Behind, it is separated from the long head of the triceps brachii by the radial nerve and a profunda brachii. It then lies upon the medial head of the triceps brachii, next upon the insertion of the coracobrachialis, and lastly on the brachialis. Laterally, it is in relation above with the median nerve and the coracobrachialis, below with the biceps brachii, the two muscles overlapping the artery to a considerable extent. Medially, its upper half is in relation with the medial antibrachial cutaneous and ulnar nerves, its lower half with the median nerve. The basilic vein lies on its medial side, but is separated from it in the lower part of the arm by the deep fascia. The artery is accompanied by two veni comitants, which lie in close contact with it, and are connected together at intervals by short transverse branches. The anti-cubital fossa. At the bend of the elbow, the brachial artery sinks deeply into a triangular interval, the anti-cubital fossa. The base of the triangle is directed upward, and is represented by a line connecting the two epicondyles of the humerus. The sides are formed by the medial edge of the brachioradialis and the lateral margin of the pronator teres. The floor is formed by the brachialis and supinator. This space contains the brachial artery, with its accompanying veins, the radial and ulnar arteries, the median and radial nerves, and the tendon of the biceps brachii. The brachial artery occupies the middle of the space and divides opposite the neck of the radius into the radial and ulnar arteries. It is covered in front by the integument, the superficial fascia, and the vena mediana cubitae, the last being separated from the artery by the lacertus fibrosus. Behind it is the brachialis, which separates it from the elbow joint. The median nerve lies close to the medial side of the artery above, but is separated from it below by the ulnar head of the pronator teres. The tendon of the biceps brachii lies to the lateral side of the artery. The radial nerve is situated upon the supinator and concealed by the brachioradialis. Peculiarities of the brachial artery as regards its course. The brachial artery, accompanied by the median nerve, may leave the medial border of the biceps brachii and descend toward the medial epicondyle of the humerus. In such cases it usually passes behind the supracondylar process of the humerus, from which a fibrous arch is in most cases thrown over the artery. It then runs beneath or through the substance of the pronator teres to the bend of the elbow. This variation bears considerable analogy with the normal condition of the artery in some of the carnivora. It has been referred to in the description of the humerus. As regards its division, occasionally the artery is divided for a short distance at its upper part into two trunks, which are united below. Frequently the artery divides at a higher level than usual, and the vessels concerned in this high division are three, viz. radial, ulnar, and interosseous. Most frequently the radial is given off high up, the other limb of the bifurcation consisting of the ulnar and interosseous. In some instances the ulnar rises above the ordinary level, and the radial and interosseous form the other limb of the division. Occasionally the interosseous arises high up. Sometimes long, slender vessels, vasa aberrantia, connect the brachial or the axillary artery with one of the arteries of the forearm or branches from them. These vessels usually join the radial. Varieties and Muscular Relations The brachial artery is occasionally concealed in some part of its course by muscular or tendinous slips derived from the coracobrachialis, biceps brachii, brachialis, or pronator teres. Collateral circulation. After the application of a ligature to the brachial artery and the upper third of the arm, the circulation is carried on by branches from the humeral circumflex and subscapular arteries, anastomizing with ascending branches from the profunda brachii. If the artery be tied below the origin of the profunda brachii and superior ulnar collateral, 
The circulation is maintained by the branches of these two arteries anastomosing with the inferior ulnar collateral, the radial and ulnar recurrence, and the dorsal interosseous. Branches. The branches of the brachial artery are profunda brachii, superior ulnar collateral, nutrient, inferior ulnar collateral, muscular. 1. The arteria profunda brachii, superior profunda artery, is a large vessel which arises from the medial and back part of the brachial, just below the lower border of the teres major. It follows closely the radial nerve, running at first backward between the medial and lateral heads of the triceps brachii, then along the groove for the radial nerve, where it is covered by the lateral head of the triceps brachii to the lateral side of the arm. There it pierces the lateral intermuscular septum, and, descending between the brachioradialis and the brachialis to the front of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, ends by anastomosing with the radial recurrent artery. It gives branches to the deltoideus and to the muscles between which it lies. It supplies an occasional nutrient artery, which enters the humerus behind the deltoid tuberosity. A branch ascends between the long and lateral heads of the triceps brachii to anastomose with the posterior humeral circumflex artery. A middle collateral branch descends in the middle head of the triceps brachii and assists in forming the anastomosis above the olecranon, and lastly, a radial collateral branch runs down behind the lateral intermuscular septum to the back of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, where it anastomoses with the interosseous recurrent and the inferior ulnar collateral arteries. 2. The nutrient artery, A. nutritia humeri, of the body of the humerus, arises about the middle of the arm and enters the nutrient canal near the insertion of the coracobrachialis. 3. The superior ulnar collateral artery, A. collateralis ulnaris superior, inferior profunda artery, of small size, arises from the brachial a little below the middle of the arm. It frequently springs from the upper part of the A profunda brachii. It pierces the medial intermuscular septum and descends on the surface of the medial head of the triceps brachii to the space between the medial epicondyle and olecranon, accompanied by the ulnar nerve, and ends under the flexor carpi ulnaris by anastomosing with the posterior ulnar recurrent and inferior ulnar collateral. It sometimes sends a branch in front of the medial epicondyle to anastomose with the anterior ulnar recurrent. 4. The Inferior Ulnar Collateral Artery A. Collateralis ulnaris inferior Anastomotica magna artery arises about 5 centimeters above the elbow. It passes medialward upon the brachialis, and piercing the medial intermuscular septum, winds around the back of the humerus between the triceps brachii and the bone, forming, by its junction with the profunda brachii, an arch above the olecranon fossa. As the vessel lies on the brachialis, it gives off branches which ascend to join the superior ulnar collateral. Others descend in front of the medial epicondyle to anastomose with the anterior ulnar recurrent. Behind the medial epicondyle, a branch anastomoses with the superior ulnar collateral and posterior ulnar recurrent arteries. 5. The muscular branches, rami muscularis, three or four in number, are distributed to the coracobrachialis, biceps brachii, and brachialis. The anastomosis around the elbow joint. The vessels engaged in this anastomosis may be conveniently divided into those situated in front of and those behind the medial and lateral epicondyles of the humerus. The branches anastomosing in front of the medial epicondyle are the anterior branch of the inferior ulnar collateral, the anterior ulnar recurrent, and the anterior branch of the superior ulnar collateral. Those behind the medial epicondyle are the inferior ulnar collateral, the posterior ulnar recurrent, 
and the posterior branch of the superior ulnar collateral. The branches anastomosing in front of the lateral epicondyle are the radial recurrent and the terminal part of the profunda brachii. Those behind the lateral epicondyle, perhaps more properly described as being situated between the lateral epicondyle and the olecranon, are the inferior ulnar collateral, the interosseous recurrent, and the radial collateral branch of the profunda brachii. There is also an arch of anastomosis above the olecranon formed by the interosseous recurrent joining with the inferior ulnar collateral and posterior ulnar recurrent. End of section 20. Recording by Leanne Howlett. of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. The Radial Artery. 4B3, The Radial Artery. A. Radialis. The radial artery appears, from its direction, to be the continuation of the brachial, but it is smaller in caliber than the ulnar. It commences at the bifurcation of the brachial, just below the bend of the elbow, and passes along the radial side of the forearm to the wrist. It then winds backward, around the lateral side of the carpus, beneath the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus, and extensors pollicis longus and brevis to the upper end of the space between the metacarpal bones of the thumb and index finger. Finally, it passes forward between the two heads of the first interosseous dorsalis into the palm of the hand, where it crosses the metacarpal bones and at the ulnar side of the hand unites with the deep volar branch of the ulnar artery to form the deep volar arch. The radial artery therefore consists of three portions, one in the forearm, a second at the back of the wrist, and a third in the hand. Relations A. In the forearm, the artery extends from the neck of the radius to the forepart of the styloid process, being placed to the medial side of the body of the bone above and in front of it below. Its upper part is overlapped by the fleshy belly of the brachioradialis. The rest of the artery is superficial, being covered by the integument and the superficial and deep fasciae. In its course downward it lies upon the tendon of the biceps brachii, the supinator, the pronator teres, the radial origin of the flexor digitorum sublimus, the flexor pollicis longus, the pronator quadratus, and the lower end of the radius. In the upper third of its course, it lies between the brachioradialis and the pronator teres. In the lower two thirds, between the tendons of the brachioradialis and flexor carpi radialis. The superficial branch of the radial nerve is close to the lateral side of the artery and the middle third of its course, and some filaments of the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve run along the lower part of the artery as it winds around the wrist. The vessel is accompanied by a pair of veni comitants throughout its whole course. B. At the wrist, the artery reaches the back of the carpus by passing between the radial collateral ligament of the wrist and the tendons of the abductor pallicis longus and extensor pallicis brevis. It then descends on the navicular and greater multangular bones and before disappearing between the heads of the first interosseous dorsalis, is crossed by the tendon of the extensor pollicis longus. In the interval between the two extensor pollicis, it is crossed by the digital rami of the superficial branch of the radial nerve, which go to the thumb and index finger. C. In the hand, it passes from the upper end of the first interosseous space, between the heads of the first interosseous dorsalis, transversely across the palm between the adductor pollicis obliquus and adductor pollicis transversus, but sometimes piercing the latter muscle 
to the base of the metacarpal bone of the little finger, where it anastomoses with the deep volar branch from the ulnar artery, completing the deep volar arch. Peculiarities The origin of the radial artery is, in nearly one case in eight, higher than usual. More often it arises from the axillary or upper part of the brachial than from the lower part of the latter vessel. In the forearm it deviates less frequently from its normal position than the ulnar. It has been found lying on the deep fascia instead of beneath it. It has also been observed on the surface of the brachioradialis instead of under its medial border, and in turning around the wrist it has been seen lying on instead of beneath the extensor tendons of the thumb. Branches the branches of the radial artery may be divided into three groups, corresponding with the three regions in which the vessel is situated. In the forearm, radial recurrent, muscular, volar carpal, superficial volar. At the wrist, dorsal carpal, first dorsal metacarpal. In the hand, princeps pollicis, volaris indices radialis, volar metacarpal, perforating, recurrent. The radial recurrent artery, A recurrens radialis, arises immediately below the elbow. It ascends between the branches of the radial nerve, lying on the supinator and then between the brachioradialis and brachialis, supplying these muscles and the elbow joint and anastomosing with the terminal part of the profunda brachii. The muscular branches, rami muscularis, are distributed to the muscles on the radial side of the forearm. The volar carpal branch, ramus carpius volaris, anterior radial carpal artery, is a small vessel which arises near the lower border of the pronator quadratus, and, running across the front of the carpus, anastomosis with the volar carpal branch of the ulnar artery. This anastomosis is joined by a branch from the volar interosseus above and by recurrent branches from the deep volar arch below, thus forming a volar carpal network which supplies the articulations of the wrist and carpus. The superficial volar branch, ramus volaris superficialis, superficialis voli artery, arises from the radial artery just where this vessel is about to wind around the lateral side of the wrist. Running forward, it passes through, occasionally over, the muscles of the ball of the thumb, which it supplies and sometimes anastomoses with the terminal portion of the ulnar artery, completing the superficial volar arch. This vessel varies considerably in size. Usually it is very small and ends in the muscles of the thumb. Sometimes it is as large as the continuation of the radial. The dorsal carpal branch, ramus carpius dorsalis, posterior radial carpal artery, is a small vessel which arises beneath the extensor tendons of the thumb. Crossing the carpus transversely toward the medial border of the hand, it anastomoses with the dorsal carpal branch of the ulnar and with the volar and dorsal interosseous arteries, to form a dorsal carpal network. From this network are given off three slender dorsal metacarpal arteries, which run downward on the second, third, and fourth interossei dorsalis and bifurcate into the dorsal digital branches for the supply of the adjacent sides of the middle, ring, and little fingers respectively, communicating with the proper volar digital branches of the superficial volar arch. Near their origins, they anastomose with the deep volar arch by the superior perforating arteries, and near their points of bifurcation with the common volar digital vessels of the superficial volar arch by the inferior perforating arteries. The first dorsal metacarpal arises just before the radial artery passes between the two heads of the first interosseous dorsalis and divides almost immediately into two branches which supply the adjacent sides of the thumb and index finger. The radial side of the thumb receives a branch directly from the radial artery. The arterior princeps pollicis arises from the radial just as it turns medialward to the deep part of the hand. 
It descends between the first Interosseus dorsalis and adductor pollicis obliquus along the ulnar side of the metacarpal bone of the thumb to the base of the first phalanx, where it lies beneath the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus and divides into two branches. These make their appearance between the medial and lateral insertions of the adductor pollicis obliquus and run along the sides of the thumb forming on the volar surface of the last phalanx an arch, from which branches are distributed to the integument and subcutaneous tissue of the thumb. The arterior volaris indices radialis, radialis indices artery, arises close to the preceding, descends between the first interosseous dorsalis and adductor pollicis transversus, and runs along the radial side of the index finger to its extremity, where it anastomoses with the proper digital artery, supplying the ulnar side of the finger. At the lower border of the adductor pollicis transversus, this vessel anastomoses with the princeps pollicis and gives a communicating branch to the superficial volar arch. The A princeps pollicis and A volaris indices radialis may spring from a common trunk termed the first volar metacarpal artery. The deep volar arch, arcus volaris profundus, deep palmar arch, is formed by the anastomosis of the terminal part of the radial artery with the deep volar branch of the ulnar. It lies upon the carpal extremities of the metacarpal bones and on the interossei, being covered by the adductor pollicis obliquus, the flexor tendons of the fingers, and the lumbar callus. Alongside of it, but running in the opposite direction, that is to say, toward the radial side of the hand, is the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. The volar metacarpal arteries, AA metacarpi volaris, palmar interosseous arteries, three or four in number, arise from the convexity of the deep volar arch. They run distally upon the interossei and anastomose at the clefts of the fingers, with the common digital branches of the superficial volar arch. The perforating branches, rami perforantis, three in number, pass backward from the deep volar arch through the second, third, and fourth interosseous spaces and between the heads of the corresponding interossei dorsalis to anastomose with the dorsal metacarpal arteries. The recurrent branches arise from the concavity of the deep volar arch. They ascend in front of the wrist, supply the intercarpal articulations, and end in the volar carpal network. End of section 21. Recording by Leanne Howlett.